Lecture 23, Vatican II, and the Papacy. We will begin this lecture with Pope St. John XXIII, who was elected in 1958 as a stopgap pope who, some hoped, would basically keep the status quo until another pope was elected. He surprised many when in 1962 he called the Second Vatican Council. After examining Vatican Council II, we will then focus our attention on the most recent post-Vatican II popes, Blessed Pope Paul VI, Pope St. John Paul II, and Pope Benedict XVI, the John John XXIII. The native Italian Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli was born into a relatively poor farming family in the Lombardy town of Sotto Il Monte. At age 11, he entered Bergamo's minor seminary. In 1904, he was ordained to the priesthood after having a month earlier obtained a doctorate. One of his earliest assignments was serving as the secretary to the bishops of Bergamo. After being a priest for only a few years, he was then assigned as a seminary teacher of church history and then later of apologetics. In 1925, he was asked to serve in the Vatican's diplomatic corps and was appointed as the apostolic visitor to Bulgaria, a predominantly orthodox Christian country. That same year, he was consecrated a bishop. His assignment to Bulgaria ended in 1934 when he was given a new assignment as the apostolic delegate to the Islamic-based country of Turkey and to the orthodox Christian country of Greece. Near the end of World War II, Ron Kali received yet another diplomatic assignment as papal nuncio to France. As France's nuncio, he helped to secretly save thousands of Jewish lives at risk of being sent to Nazi concentration camps. His last assignment, before being elected to the papacy, was as the Patriarch of Venice, which entailed receiving the title of Cardinal in 1953. In 1958, Roncalli was elected Pope on November 4th and assumed the name John XXIII. As Pope, he became well known as someone who cares for people in practical ways. He visited prisoners, the sick, invited people to eat with him. On January 25, 1959, only three months into his papacy, he announced an ecumenical council would be held, Vatican Council II. Once necessary preparations were made, the council finally opened on October 11, 1962. His prior ministry of working in the non-Catholic lands of Bulgaria, Turkey, and Greece helped him greatly in opening the church to the world. Vatican Council II, 1962-1965 According to the historian Father John O'Malley, Vatican Council II was, quote, quite possibly the biggest meeting in the history of the world, end of quote. A meeting in this context refers to an ordered event where issues are discussed. 2,200 bishops, 500 theologians, Protestant and Orthodox observers, and media representatives all attended this largest meeting in history. When it comes to church history, the size of Vatican II was not its primary distinctive quality. Vatican Council II distinguished distinguish itself in its style from all other ecumenical church councils, beginning with the first ecumenical council of Nicaea in 325. Unlike all the previous councils, Vatican Council II did not issue a single canon that condemned behavior. Despite its conciliatory style, there were hotly debated issues at the council. The five most debated issues, as identified by O'Malley, were the following. The liturgy, scripture in relationship to tradition, the Catholic Church in relationship to non-Christian religions, religious liberty, and collegiality. A number of sub-themes were also interwoven throughout these debates. These included the relationship of the center to the periphery, change in relationships of civility, Western culture in relationship to non-Western cultures, and styles of leadership. When these documents are read, these debated issues and sub-themes become concretely evident. Vatican Council II issued 16 documents that are arranged in the following hierarchical order, with the first having the most weight, four constitutions, nine decrees, and three declarations. The four constitutions are De Verbum, Lumen Gentium, Gaudium et Spes, and Sacro Sanctum Cochilium. The nine decrees are Christus Dominus Apostolicum Actuasatem, 
ad gentes optatum totius orientalium ecclesiarum perfecte caritates presbyterium ordinis unitatis redingratio and intermarifica. The t three declarations are dignitas humanae, gravissimum educationis, and nostre etate. On the church's relationship with non-Christian religions is the last one. Debated issue one, the liturgy. The constitution on the sacred liturgy is the fruit of much debate. One common misconception that people have about this constitution concerns the use of Latin. According to a popular account, after a heated debate, most of the Council Fathers eliminated Latin from the liturgy. Actually, the Council Fathers voted to retain Latin as the official language of the Western Roman Rite, while permitting some vernacular to be used. An influential Council Father during this debate was the Melkar Patriarch Maximus IV Sai. Sai argued that Latin is not the universal language of the Church, especially of Eastern Churches. Furthermore, he boldly stated in French and not in Latin, as the other bishops were doing, Christ, after all, spoke the language of his contemporaries. In tension with this cardinal's argument, some held that Latin well serves as a symbol of the Church's universality. Others, those, disagreed with the contention that many at the time perceived the Church's use of Latin in non-Western cultures as a remaining sign of, post, of past Western imperialism. Obviously, there were other debates despite, dis, besides the use of Latin, such as the role of the lady in the liturgy, active versus passive participation, etc., since we do not have time to go in depth into the Council documents. If you wish, then please see the resources on Vatican Council II given in the cited resources. Debated Issue 2, Scripture in Relationship to Tradition The Constitution on Divine Revelation represents the culmination of the discussions the Council Fathers had on Scripture and, in part, Scripture's relationship to tradition. The meaning of the two source teaching of scripture and tradition stemming from the Council of Trent was debated. To what extent, they argued, does tradition contain truths not found in sacred scripture? They finally settled on stating in De Verbum the following. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with the other. For both of them, flowing out from the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal. Hence, both sacred scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. Sacred tra tradition and sacred scripture make up a single deposit of the word of God which is entrusted to the church. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the Church alone. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture and the magisterium of the Church are so connected and associated that one of them cannot stand without the others. Working together, each in its own way, under the action of the one Holy Spirit, all contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. Debated Issue 3. The Catholic Church and Non-Christian Religions in accordance with Vatican Council II's overall conciliatory style, the Declaration on the Church's Relation with Non-Christian Religions does not condemn errors within non-Christian religions, in particular Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Islam. And this is what it states, and I quote, The Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. She has a high regard for the manner of life and conduct, the precepts and doctrines which, although differing in many ways from her own teaching, nevertheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men. Yet she proclaims, and is in duty bound to proclaim without fail, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. End of quote. Debated Issue 4. Religious Liberty and the Separation of Church and State. Up until Vatican Council II, Catholics commonly held that the Church ought to be supported by the state and be the official religion of the state. 
After the French Revolution, at the end of the 18th century, Catholics associated democracy and freedom with violent persecution of the Catholic Church. In many people's minds, the political system that was most fitting for the Catholic Church was the pre-French Revolution, markedly hierarchical political order of a monarchy supported by nobility. Full political rights, it was held, was not to be granted to non-Catholic religions in countries that are predominantly Catholic since error has no rights. And the church and state ought to be mutually intertwined. However, during Vatican Council II, the Council Fathers and the Declaration on Religious Liberty acknowledged that non-Catholic religions do have rights and that the Catholic Church and the state may be legitimately separated in a moderate manner. The Declaration states the following, quote, The Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. The right of the human person to religious freedom must be given such recognition in the constitutional order of society as will make it a civil right, end of quote. Earlier in 1963, Pope St. John XXIII, in his encyclical Pachamentaris, affirmed the legitimate freedom to choose one's religion by declaring, and I quote, Also among man's rights is that of being able to worship God in accordance with the right dictates of his own conscience, and to profess his religion both in private and in public. According to the clear teaching of Lactantius, this is the very condition of our birth, that we render to the God who made us that just homage which is his due, that we acknowledge him alone as God and follow him. It is from this ligature of piety, which binds us and joins us to God that religion derives its name. End of quote. Debated Issue 5, Collegiality. The decree on the pastoral office of bishops recognize that bishops have authority by virtue of their office. This means that their authority as bishops is not simply delegated to them by the Pope. In the words of the Council, and I quote, the bishops by virtue of their sacramental consecration and their hierarchical communion with the head of the college and its other members are constituted members of the episcopal body. End of quote. Lumen Gentium even more pointedly asserts that bishops are not, quote, to be regarded as vicars of the Roman pontiff, for they exercise the power which they possess in their own right and are called in the truest sense of the term prelates of the people whom they govern. End of quote. As well described by O'Malley, it is incorrect to perceive the bishop's relationship to the Pope as equivalent to a regional manor, manager's relationship to their corporate executive officers. Instead, bishops as shepherds, and I quote, together with their head, the supreme pontiff, and never apart from him, and of quote, participate individually and corporately in apostolic succession and in the one priesthood of Jesus Christ. Sub-themes. As explained by O'Malley, Vatican Council II's debates and discussion were interwoven with several sub-themes. One sub-theme concerned the relationship between the center, the Pope, and his curia, and everyone else. Another theme that was theme, sub-theme that was discussed throughout the cult council was Western culture in relationship to non-Western cultures. Two questions that the council fathers faced were as follows. May Catholic worship, the training of seminarians, and the expression of theology be legitimately influenced by non-Western context, and if so, to what extent? In addition, what aspects in doctrine must remain stable, and what aspects may be legitimately changed? Blessed Pope Paul VI, the Pope who succeeded Pope St. John XXIII, clamped down excess on excessively in innovative expressions of Eucharistic doctrine by inserting in his 1965 encyclical Mysterium Fide, and this is what he says. To give an example of what we are talking about, it is not permissible to extol the so-called community mass in such a way to detract from masses that are celebrated privately, or to concentrate on the notion of sacramental sign as if the symbolism, which no one will deny, is certainly present in the most blessed Eucharist, fully expressed and exhausted the manner of Christ's presence in this sacrament, or to discuss the mystery of transubstantiation without mentioning what the Council of Trent had to say about the marvelous conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the, 
into the body and the whole substance of the wine into the blood of Christ, as if they involved nothing more than transignification or transfinalization, as they call it. Or finally, to propose and act upon the opinion that Christ our Lord is no longer present in the consecrated host to remain after the celebration of the sacrifice of the Mass has been completed. End of quote. Post-Vatican II Papacy Blessed, John, Blessed Pope Paul VI After John XXIII died, Pope Paul VI took over leading the Council and the Church Universal. By selling the papal tiara, the crown worn by popes, and giving the money to the poor, Paul VI confirmed a servant style leadership in accordance with the ancient papal title, A Servant of the Servants of God, used by Pope St. Gregory the Great. One way he served the people of God was by overseeing the revision of the liturgy. This culminated in 1969 when Pope Paul VI approved a new ordinary of the Roman Rite Mass. He was also at the service of unity with non-Catholics. His deep concern for unity led him to meet the ecumenical Orthodox Patriarch Athenagoras in Jerusalem in 1964. In 1965, these leaders signed a Catholic Orthodox joint declaration that lifted the excommunications of 1054. This gesture, though, did not end the schism between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Churches. Another example of his service of unity with non-Catholics was his outreach and continuation with John XXIII's spirit to the leaders of the Soviet Union. In 1966, he graciously received at the Vatican the Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko and then in 1967 the Soviet President Podgorny. The following year, in 1968, Paul VI issued the encyclical Humanae Vitae that many interpreted at that time and even now as having caused, having caused a deep division in the Catholic Church. Pope Paul VI, though, issued this encyclical not for the goal of short-term unity, but for deep, lasting unity founded on truth. As is well known, the truth he defended in this encyclical was that of babies and bonding, or the unitive and procreative dimensions of marriage, are never to be deliberately separated. Servant of God, John Paul I. John Paul I succeeded Pope Paul VI, but only was Pope for 33 days after his papal inauguration, until he died on September 28, 1978. Pope St. John Paul II, 1978 to 2005. At only 58 years old, Carl Wotiga became the first non-Italian pope for over 455 years since 1522. A sampling of events from his fascinating life as pope include the following. After traveling to the Soviet-ruled Poland in 1979, he helped to bring about the Polish Solidarity Movement, which led to the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. In 1980, he approved a pastoral provision that permitted former Anglican priests to become Catholic priests. The following year, on the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima, May 13th, the Turk Mehmet Ali Akka attempted to assassinate John Paul II. John Paul II credited the Blessed Mother for saving his life on her feast day. Out of otherworldly compassion for the man who tried to kill him, John Paul II visited Ali Akka in prison and the two talked privately. In 1995, another Attempt on John Paul II's life was made, this time by the radical Islamic terrorist organization Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda had planned to kill John Paul II by situating a suicide bomber, dressed as a priest, close to the Holy Father when he was celebrating World Youth Day in the Philippines on January 15, 1995. Despite the numerous assassination attempts on his life, Pope John Paul II continued to be an agent of mercy and reconciliation, as is evident in his support of Vatican and Lutheran representatives signing a joint declaration of the Doctrine of Justification on October 31, 1999, in his 2000 visit to Israel where he prayed at the Western Wall and visited the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Museum, and in 2001 when he prayed at the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, Syria. Benedict XVI John Paul II's successor, Benedict XVI, 
continued the path of reconciliation and communion, but was often misunderstood. His concern for communion was made explicitly evident in 1972 when he founded the theological journal Communio along with Hans Urs von Balthasar. Aware of the then Cardinal Ratzinger's ability to unite people in truth, John Paul II appointed him prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, a position Ratzinger held until 2005. In 2005, he was elected Pope and assumed the name Benedict XVI. In 2006, during a September 12th lecture at Germany's University of Regensburg, Benedict XVI caused some Muslim to become exceedingly angry when he referred to a 1391 conversation that the Byzantine emperor had with a Persian. In their dialogue, the emperor commented, Show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. A few years later, in 2007, during a visit in Brazil, Benedict XVI once again was the subject of controversy when he described the native population at the time of the Spanish conquest of the Americas as silently longing for the Christian faith. Benedict XVI's ability to go to the core issues received great appreciation when he publicly corrected the founder of the Legionaries of Christ, Father Maciel de Yoyado. Under Benedict XVI's leadership in 2006, the Vatican stated, and I quote, Since 1998, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith has received accusations, which were already made public in part, against Father Maciel, founder of the Congregation of the Legionaries of Christ, for offenses reserves the exclusive competency of this dicastery. End of quote. This was followed by the Vatican issuing another statement which ordered Father Maciel to live, I quote, a reserved life of prayer and penance, renouncing all public ministry. Finally, in 2010, after more than 1,000 legionaries were interviewed and hundreds of written testimonies were sifted through, the Holy Steed stated, and I quote, the very serious and objectively immoral behavior of Father Maciel as incontrovertible evidence has confirmed sometimes resulted in actual crimes and manifests a life devoid of scruples and of genuine religious sentiment, end of quote. In this statement, Pope Benedict XVI assured Father Maciel's victims, I quote, they will not be left on their own. The church is firmly resolved to accompany them and help them on the path of purification that awaits them. It will also mean dealing sincerely with all those who, within and outside the legion, were victims of sexual abuse and of the power system devised by the founder. End of quote. Possibly due to a combination of factors, including the stress of the office and the repeated misinterpretations of his actions and words, Benedict XVI resigned the papacy in 2013. Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio of Argentina succeeded him as Pope Francis and took to heart the ancient concept of the Pope as servant leader. Reflecting on our most recent popes, in light of providence, it has been remarked that John Paul II clearly taught the Church what to believe, Benedict XVI complemented this papal st style by explaining why we believe what the church teaches, Pope Francis' continuity with his predecessors then mandated that the church practice what she believes. God bless.